So here's a fun fact about me. I love anthologies in book form, you know, short stories and that. TV, movies, I love them all. I basically grew up watching episodes of Beyond Belief Fact or Fiction. And I have watched every version of The Twilight Zone. You know, I tend to watch mostly horror, science fiction and fantasy, but with a few exceptions. I've seen the popular ones, the not so popular ones, the very obscure ones, the good, the bad, the terrible. Did you know that TV One had a TV movie horror anthology special that came out on Halloween 2014 called Fright Night Files? It even had a sequel that came out the following year in March and it was renamed Fear Files. It was terrible. I enjoyed it. I've watched a lot of the horror ones for children, and I even watched some anthologies that I had no business watching at a young age. If anyone can remember Red Shoe Diaries, please put a high heel shoe emoji in the comments, please. But yeah, (laughs) speaking of somewhat forgotten anthologies, who remembers Tales from the Hood? Tales from the Hood is a 1995 horror anthology movie directed by Rusty Cundiff. It was co-written by Rusty and Darren Scott, who produced Menace to Society. They had worked together on Cundiff's directorial debut, Fear of a Black Hat. Rusty Cundiff was also an actor who had a few small roles on TV and movies, one of them being Spike Lee's School Days. Spike Lee had seen Fear of a Black Hat and was interested in what Cundiff and Scott were working on next together, which was an unfinished script for a horror anthology. Lee asked them for a completed version and then came on as executive producer. At the time, he had a deal at Universal, so they tried pitching it to them at first, but Universal was unsure on how to market it, so they decided to pass. So Lee, Cundiff and Scott ended up at Savoy Pictures. It's clear to see that Tales from the Hood draws some inspiration from the horror anthologies that were popular back then. Namely, Tales from the Crypt, but not so much the HBO TV series, but the 1972 movie, especially when you take into account the wraparound story, where the Crypt Keeper was making people relive their deaths to open and close each story. Tales from the Hood wraparound story was about a trio of drug dealers that go to a funeral home to pick up some drugs found by the funeral director, Mr. Sims, played by the late Clarence Williams III. He regales them with full stories on how some of the bodies in his funeral home died, with the final one relating back to the drug dealers. Many consider Tales from the Hood to be a horror comedy, and I think that's most to do with that wraparound story. The drug dealers deliver some jokes early on. Yo, hold on, hold on, hold on, bulldog. I'm supposed to kill someone that's already dead, man. What? Yeah, I'm supposed to kill someone that's already dead. That's like killing some shit twice, man. <laughs> yeah, like some refried beans and some shit. Man, I never understood that, man. Why the fuck you gonna refry some beans, man? Why not just fry that shit right the first time and get up? <laughs> and Clarence Williams III as Mr. Sims is a very eccentric character. The shit. <laughs> the shit. The drugs. You get the drugs, then I get the money. Okay. Rusty Cundiff has said that the label of it being a horror comedy has a lot to do with the way the studio chose to market it. I've never considered it a horror comedy. You look at something like Scream and that's a horror comedy. I feel personally Tales from the Hood is different. There are certainly moments in it that produce laughter, but taking it in totality, there are less laughs. You look at the first episode with the cops and the zombies. I don't think there are really any laughs in the episode Boys Don't Cry with David Allen Gray and Paula Jai Parker. The Corbin Benson episode and certainly the Crazy K section have absolutely nothing funny in them. I absolutely agree with him here. What was so funny about the police beating a black man to death while Billie Holiday's Strange Fruit plays in the background? The murder montage that Crazy K was forced to watch? I always fast forward that bit. The only segment that I found funny besides the wraparound story was the one where the politician from the clan got torn apart by the dolls. And I know I'm not the only one who found that funny, because... <laughs> Listen... <laughs> Tales from the Hood is a horror movie with socio-political themes and hints of comedy to offer moments of levity so black audiences are not weighed down by those heavier moments. The social commentary that they touch on does feel well thought out and not haphazardly tossed in to be deep. I don't always fully agree with that commentary, namely the black-on-black violence comparisons within the Crazy K section, but that was certainly a big talking point of the 90s, so yeah. In Road Cop Revelation, the main character, Clarence Smith, witnesses his fellow cops beat a black councilman to death and sully his reputation by planting drugs on him. He did not report them, you know, the whole blue wall of silence. And you never 
rat out a fellow officer. And you never, never break the code. He is just wrapped with guilt. And he too is ultimately punished for his inaction. Where were you when I needed you, brother? Then there's KKK comeuppance, the one with the racist politician. He takes up residence in a former plantation house and has a light-skinned black man in his employ that is helping him revamp his image. This is an obvious evocation of the light-skinned house negro that has aligned themselves with whiteness and white supremacy. He is also punished. As Zora Neale Hurston said, all my skin folk ain't kin folk. Where many anthologies of the 80s and 90s were often described as modern morality plays, Tales from the Hood depict stories of retribution, real human monsters, those who wield abusive power over others, being met with violent supernatural vengeance, or justice. The movie was released in 1995, three short years after the police that assaulted Rodney King were acquitted, and the LA riots that followed soon after. Police brutality, racist politicians and domestic abuse and gang violence are as common issues today as they were in 1995. With the many injustices in the world where people in power can enact violence and cruelty with no remorse and some are even rewarded for their vile actions. Hoping to get justice through the legal system is as fruitless as wishing on a shooting star to reshape our reality. Who hasn't imagined an escapist fantasy of some cosmic entity more powerful than the people committing those atrocities to descend upon those people so they can finally be met with the consequences of their actions? Tales from the Hood illustrates that perfectly. Why fear goblins, ghouls and zombies with no conscience when a more tangible fear exists? The supernatural monsters start looking more like friends rather than foe. They can even be our saviours. Tales from the Hood is looked back fondly as a cult classic and has cemented its place as a must-watch in the black horror pantheon. I definitely think it's worth watching today to get a feel of certain talking points of the 90s. And the practical effects are really cool. Especially the stop-motion work for the dolls, all that puppetry and stuff. I have always said that stop-motion is the creepiest looking animation style. It just works. Now let's talk about the stellar cast of black actors here, many of whom were in the early stages of their careers. I mentioned the late, great Clarence Williams III as Mr. Sims, who was absolutely amazing, acting from head to toe. The build-up from this strange and kooky old man to this demonic hell creature. I love it. The casting of David Allen Greer, who was known for doing comedy, specifically in Living Colour, I'm sure the film's audience were used to him making them laugh and... Here he was, playing this just evil, evil character. There's also Paula Jai Parker acting alongside him, and this was pretty much the same time as Friday. Friday came out the same year as Tales from the Hood, so very close. Lamont Bentley was shockingly scary to me. This came out a year before Moesha, but I had watched this a few years after seeing him as the lovable neighbour Hakim. So seeing him swearing and being this killer was just another level for me back then. There's also the wonderful Rosalind Cash and this was her second to last film before she passed away and she's just excellent. So when I was watching a documentary that I have referenced a lot on my channel, Horror Noir, A History of Black Horror, Rusty Cundiff mentioned that Tales from the Hood 2 would be coming out soon. Back to telling stories that hopefully deal with some issues that people have. This one I think is, there's some stuff that's a little headier. It's a different kind of tale story. It touches people in a different way, mm. though it is scary. I was surprised because I had never heard of this. Like, how did I miss this? So that very same day, I looked for it, found it, and watched it. And I fucking hated it. The success of Get Out had studios looking at other black horror movies that they could greenlight next. Rusty Cundiff had stated in interviews that he and Darren Scott were trying to get another Tales from the Hood movie out there for years, but nobody was biting until Get Out came along. It always comes back to Get Out. So 23 years later, here we are, back with another one, and I was looking forward to it. Cundiff and Scott were coming back as writers and directors, and Keith David would be taking over the role of Mr. Sims as Clarence Williams III had retired from acting. I never saw a trailer. I just went straight into the movie, snacks in hand and hopes high. 
and then came the opening title sequence. So the opening title sequence for a film is very important, I feel, especially in horror. A well-done one can set the tone and communicate to the audience exactly what they're in for. Let's take a look at the opening titles for the first movie. So here we have sinister eerie music with extreme close-ups of a gun, the smoke from a joint and bones from a skeleton. Finally ending with a close-up of a skull wearing a bandana with a gold tooth, a joint in its mouth and gun in hand with a final zoom on the sunglasses that fades into a transition to the first scene. I love it. It's simple, it's effective, tells you what you're in for especially with a movie called Tales from the Hood. Now let's compare that with the sequel. Dancing CGI fire skeletons. Interesting choice. While I agree with Cundiff that the first movie was not a horror comedy, I don't think the same can be said for the sequel. This is more comedy than horror, and I was not laughing. Oh, 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 uh oh. You know what, yeah? It felt like this was intended to be a Scary Movie 6 script, but the screenwriter was told that the studio decided not to beat a dead horse anymore, and they just decided to recycle the script with a quick rewrite to make it scary, and throw in some callbacks and Easter eggs from the first Tales from the Hood movie just for the fans. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense to me. The best way I can even describe it, really, is that Tales from the Hood is just confused, misguided, and over the top. And you get that before any line of dialogue is ever even spoken. Dancing fire skeletons aside, the look of everything just feels like a downgrade. There's a lack of creepiness. Most horror movies take place at night because the night can be dark and full of terrors, blah, blah. That's scary time. But if you opt to have a horror movie that takes place in broad daylight, you need to know how to properly convey an unsettling atmosphere. And, you know, that's usually down to the cinematographer. The cinematography for the first movie was done by Anthony B. Richmond, who had worked on Vampira, the 1992 Candyman, Cherry Falls, and Legally Blonde, the variety. The cinematography in Tales from the Hood 2 was done by Keith L. Smith, who had worked on the TV series Black Jesus, Saints and Sinners, and the movie Hair Show. As for the horror genre, Smith worked on BET's horror comedy anthology movie and later TV series starring Flavor Flav called Night Tales. Honestly surprised I never came across that one until now. He also worked on TV One's Fright Night Files. Hello again. The wraparound story this time is very different from the first. Like literally night and day. Because you know the first one took place at night and this one takes place during the day. You get it. Set in the not so distant future, a for profit prison owner named Dumas Beach, as in dumb ass bitch, ha 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 is overseeing the creation of an AI police or robo-patriots that can learn from first-hand or second-hand experience to enforce the law. Beach enlists Mr. Sims, a master storyteller, to help the robots better determine who is a criminal threat and suggest the theme of the stories be Black Lives Matter. Well, let's pull one from the headlines. Now, since I already have so many black lives filling the beds of my facilities, how about black lives? lives matter. How very odd and convoluted. I know with a sequel you want to do bigger and better than the original by going down a completely different path and the Welcome to Robo Hell wraparound story to me was taking inspiration from the most popular and relevant anthology series to come out in the recent decade, Black Mirror. I just think they were trying to say too much already with just the wraparound story. Just explaining the plot was enough to make me feel a little bit winded compared to a trio of drug dealers get told a story by a funeral director. That's very simple. But I think it further illustrates my point of it just being too much. And we are barely in the movie. And as the movie progresses, the wraparound story keeps adding more and more themes that they want to talk about. So we end up with the Black Lives Matter movement, for-profit prisons, anti-immigration rhetoric, the Me Too movement, 
all coming from this Trump stand-in. This story begins, as many tales in the hood do, with a violent beatdown. He said it! He said it! As for the tales themselves, they were awful. The first story, good golly, I thought it would be scary. I've talked about how blackface minstrels unnerve and frighten me, but this tale was just weird. It was trying to say a lot of things from the gross fetishization of blackness by white people and black people who suffer from big time internalized racism. You know those whitewashed black people that let their white friends treat them any old way and demean themselves for their approval? Yeah, that. At the end of the story, the antagonist, I suppose he is, pretty much looks at the camera almost and just tells us the nature of the beast in this story. Fucking white women and having babies. But how dare they call you a stereotype? You're just the creation they designed you to be. <laughs> Message! The other stories were just as bad, with scenes that went on for way too long and were completely unnecessary. Weird dialogue that was all exposition, silly music and sound effects. If they were going to lean into the comedy in certain areas, why did it have to be like this? Oh my god. <laughs> Baby, is it really you? Yes, it is. And you are looking fine tonight, sugar. For context, this story is about a white, fake TV medium who becomes possessed by the spirit of a former pimp that was murdered. But the absolute worst story for me was the last one called Sacrifice, which I felt was in such poor taste and exploitative. The story was about black voter suppression and how Henry, a black Republican councilman, was intending to vote in favour of a polling station being shut down. Henry and his pregnant white wife are being haunted by the spirit of Emmett Till. The story then proceeds to turn into a It's a Wonderful Life type of situation, which now that I think about it, is basically the plot of the film Our Friend Martin. So Emmett Till gets a glimpse of the future and realises he died for nothing and chooses to live. So he goes back into the past to do things differently and apologise to the sadistic white men that were hell-bent on killing them. And they actually let him go. As if an apology would have made a difference to them. Black people were getting lynched for just breathing too loud, but in this universe, an apology was all that it took for these white men to let him go. As a result, history was altered and the civil rights movement never happened. And in the present day, the police are unambiguously a KKK organisation. Henry is told that he is not respecting the sacrifices that the people who were murdered made towards racial equality. Emmett Till, Martin Luther King Jr., the four girls who were bombed in the church, and many others are spirits who all confront him. I am so tired of this narrative that people who were murdered by white supremacist individuals or institutional powers such as the FBI, CIA and the police all sacrificed themselves. George Floyd didn't sacrifice himself. Emmett Till didn't sacrifice himself. Those girls were at church for Sunday school. They did not sacrifice themselves like Jesus on a cross. Every story just felt wrong. The tone was all over the place, confused on whether it wanted to be deep or funny or scary. They couldn't quite commit to anything fully to be a coherent movie. They told us the theme right at the beginning and all throughout they were trying so hard to get the message across as if the audience wouldn't get it if they weren't being explicitly obvious. The practical effects and the costumes were really lacking. There's barely any prosthetic makeup and the CGI is there. It's obvious that the production was working with a significantly lower budget compared to the first movie. However, we horror fans can point to many low-budget horror movies that are great and worked with what they had. Looking at everything in the movie, I'm going to assume that the lion's share of the budget went to that damn robot and Keith David's paycheck. Speaking of Keith David, he did the best with the material that he was given. The original Mr. Sims was this weird eccentric who seemed to be easily distracted with telling a story but was really just toying with his victims. The new Mr. Sims is lacking that chaotic energy and there wasn't any unnerving tension that was building up to the big reveal. And he wasn't really tormenting Dumas Beach either. And that bitch deserved to be tormented. And another thing, why was his trigger word shit? Ah, the shit! No, Mr. Beach, they do not understand the shit. 
In the first film, the shit that they were referring to was the drugs, and given the gleeful, creepy personality of Mr. Sims, he would repeat the word with a deranged and sly smirk, as if he was barely containing his excitement. Don't worry. You'll get the shit. You'll be knee deep in the shit. He was never offended by the use of profanity. It didn't set him off, so why the change? Did they just forget? I think the intention was to have Mr. Sims be the same devil demon thing wearing a different skin suit, but I don't think Keith David was able to recreate that manic energy. Certainly not with this script. When I think about the roles Keith David has taken on that were more villainous, particularly in his voice work, they were more calculating a little bit more cold and menacing. That may have been a better fit here, especially when you look at how he was styled in this movie and compare it to the first one. The new Mr. Sims looks very stylish and sleek in his tailored suit. This does not convey maniacal eccentric on the brink. Anyway, stop putting Keith David in bad slash mediocre movies. He's a legend. As for the rest of the cast, a lot of new faces. I had to keep in mind that many of the actors in the first movie were in the early stages of their career and some of the more established black actors like Clarence Williams III, Rosalind Cash and David Allen Greer didn't have a lot of opportunities to work in a variety of roles. The landscape has changed a little bit for black actors. So the pool of actors that they could get for this film on this budget won't be as seasoned to make a weak script sound good. All I can say is that they did the best with what they were given. After the disappointment that was the sequel, I assume that this would be the nail in the coffin for Tales from the Hood, but I was wrong. Dead wrong. During lockdown 2.0 or 3.0, who even acknowledges the concept of time anymore? I was flipping through the apps and I saw a poster for Tales from the Hood 3 and Tony Todd was on it. I was surprised that another one got made. And they actually got Mr. Sweet's horror movie icon, Tony Todd, in there too. I did some digging because how and why? Just like with the second movie, this one was being distributed by Universal Film Pictures. But instead of being a straight-to-video on-demand thing, Tales from the Hood Free aired on the network that has historically pushed out content with black leads in speculative fiction. The sci-fi network, of course. <laughs> Who else? Seeing as it was locked down and I had nothing else to do, I said, fuck it, let's see how bad this actually is. And honestly, I was surprised because I liked it. So this time, they decided to forego the opening title sequence. Save it to the end, and it's fine. Graveyard, flashing images of scary stuff, very American horror story. It's okay. Given the visceral reaction to the second one, I can understand why the directors were feeling apprehensive on whether they should include it at the beginning or not. But yeah, like I was saying, this time we jump straight into the wraparound story from the mouths of babes and demons. Tony Todd's character William and a little girl Brooklyn make their way through a desolate forest graveyard as they approach an abandoned building to get away from the mysterious masked figures pursuing them. The skull with the gold tooth which has become this film series recognisable mascot makes an appearance on the headstone of a grave. Inside that building, to pass the time and distract themselves from their impending doom, Brooklyn tells William a few stories. Alright, we are off to a great start. This is completely different from both movies. It's kind of spooky and foreboding. It's interesting that they chose a more serious tone. Also, William isn't the storyteller like I assumed he would be. It's Brooklyn who starts almost every story with What are you doing? William is shifty and suspicious. At first I thought he was Brooklyn's parent or guardian who was protecting her, but the way he was behaving and every time we'd return to them, we'd learn a little bit more until the big reveal at the end. The stories aren't a hot mess either. Tales from the Hood has moved away from stories of supernaturally powered revenge to a blend of vengeance and morality plays. I'm not mad at this. At least there was a coherent theme to the stories. A person makes a choice to do bad things for their own self-interest, only for them to have bad things happen to them. It's tried and true. It has worked for Tales from the Crypt, Creep Show, and a plethora of horror anthologies. One story is an outlier, though. The bunker seems like it was trying to do an updated version of KKK Comeuppance, or it centers on a white man going on a racist rant. But at the end, there's a surprise twist, and the whole story seems better suited for a Twilight Zone episode, in my opinion. 
The look of this movie is an improvement to me. Yes, it does look like a made-for-TV sci-fi movie, but I do not mind that. I have watched my fair share of made-for-TV sci-fi movies. The set design and costumes were fine. They worked well within their budget and things were appropriately scaled down. No leaping robots shooting lasers. The CGI is there, but not entirely distracting. Overall, it was very simple, but sometimes simple works better. The acting is an improvement. The actors here had a better script to work with. Plenty of new faces. No one was a huge standout for me, but they all did a good job. Now, I thought having Tony Todd was a treat, but we were truly blessed with the presence of Lynn Whitfield. She is in one of my favourite segments where she plays a former opera singer obsessed with a recording of her one-time stage performance and keeps replaying it to relive her one moment of true happiness. This happened to be the first Tales from the Hood story that centred on black women. And no, I do not count Good Golly because that was about a white girl and her black best friend that was also her pet. To me, this movie is the true sequel. When watching the third film, you can see that Cundiff and Scott had learned a lot on what not to do from the second instalment. Because it was such a vast improvement, I even saw some critics say that they were hopeful for a fourth movie. Since the last movie was a made-for-TV affair, I believe the natural progression should be TV. Tales from the Hood as an episodic anthology TV series can be an excellent vehicle for new black talent, writers, directors, actors, and so on. Still, even if there is a fourth movie, I think that Scott and Cundiff should take a step back and allow others in the creative chair. We've seen what they can do and what they had to say, so maybe passing the torch seems like the best option to breathe new life into the series. Three movies and just one story centering on black women? Come on now. Anyways, I think that's why the second film felt so confusing and maybe a little bit out of touch when compared to the first one. Cundiff was a young man and has said many stories came from real life things he witnessed. The second film told us that they were ripping from the headlines, but like Twitter headlines without clicking on the article to go a little bit deeper, you know what I mean? This Halloween, if you've never heard of Tales from the Hood, give it a watch, you might like it. Just skip the second movie. Or no, you can watch that too and be just as confused as I was. As I am editing this right now, I just learned that Shudder released a new anthology movie, Horror Noir, that is in relation to the documentary. There's six stories here and it's two hours long. I'm gonna watch it now. So, quick thank you to all my patrons, the wonderful Cheyenne Lynn, the wonderful Hariana Hook, the wonderful Mariah, and the wonderful Kemi. If you want to join my Patreon and have access to exclusive content, it's right here. I'm gonna go watch this movie now. Bye.